Thank you, thank you. Good evening. Uh, do you recall where you happened to be on November 9th, 1994? Uh, I do. The Republicans had just captured Congress for the first time in 40 years, and I was hurrying to a basement office on Capitol Hill whose occupant had arrived as usual before dawn. After years of working on poverty issues in a party that generally ignored them, Ron Haskins was suddenly a very important man. The incoming speaker, Newt Gingrich, was vowing to uh, hold Bill Clinton to his pledge to end welfare, and as the leading welfare expert on the staff of the Ways and Means Committee, Ron would write much of the new law. Covering story, the story for the New York Times, I was eager to know where things were headed. Ron leaned over and whispered two conspiratorial words. Block grants, he said. At the other end of the Pennsylvania Avenue, Isabel Sawhill oversaw welfare policy at the White House Office of Management and Budget. A centrist Democrat, she had come to the job with blue chip credentials from the serious side of the think tank world. Bell was a public intellectual, equally at home with big picture thoughts and the minutia of data sets. She had been worried for several years about the rightward drift of the welfare debate, and now she clearly had cause. Many of the Republicans' proposals were too radical to contemplate. Amid the battle that followed, I never imagined that two leaders on opposing sides would create one of the city's most productive partnerships. But even then, they were each unusual Washington figures. Unusually civil and uncivil times, unusually careful with their facts, and unusually willing to acknowledge the truth in opposing arguments. Few people have modeled the virtues that Senator Moynihan brought to public policy debates as much as Ron and Bell. What they've done together at the Brookings Institution is remarkable. They've kept data, not dogma, at the center of their work, and they've bridged, even transcended, partisan divides. As other Washington institutions have grown more ideologically entrenched, they have embodied bipartisanship at its best collaborative, solution-oriented, and public-spirited. Since leaving Capitol Hill, Ron has especially gone against the grain. He succeeded, of course, in block-granting welfare, bringing unprecedented change to the safety net. But then he did something even more remarkable. He devoted much of his remaining career to studying how the new law worked and how it could be made to work better. He did this at a time when leaders of both parties showed little interest in monitoring the program and all too much interest in proclaiming its unadulterated success. When states played games with the money, Ron called them out. When the recessions depleted state coffers, Ron pushed for a $5 billion fund to sustain benefits. One of the things I admire most about Ron's post-government career is the attention he has paid to the deeply disadvantaged. Even in the boom days of the late 90s, Ron warned that people at the very bottom were losing ground. They were being left with neither welfare nor work, and it was unclear how they were getting by. Of course, he continued to make the case for the law's general success, but he never imagined that this support would require him to ignore its areas of failure. On the contrary, he seemed to feel honor-bound to confront them, and he did so with a candor and a clarity that may have cost him some conservative friends. Bell was one of the first people I met 25 years ago when I started my job at the Times. I have a vivid memory of our first conversation. I was trying to get my bearings on a debate with unsettling racial overtones. Did the so-called underclass exist? If so, what was it? Was this a useful uh, construct or just another way of blaming the victim? Certainly no one knew better than Senator Moynihan the dangers such questions could hold. Bell's approach was confident, measured, and above all empirical. She emphasized the economic forces that were punishing poor people, deindustrialization, and falling wages. But she cautioned that behavior also played a role. Decisions about staying in school, keeping a job, and forming stable marriages. William Julius Wilson, another Moynihan Prize recipient, made it respectable to talk about the underclass in academia. Bell made it respectable in Washington. I can't think of any Democrat besides Senator Moynihan himself who has been more consistent and prescient in warning that the rise of single parenthood posed new problems for the poor. Just as Ron has urged conservatives to acknowledge deep poverty, Bell has urged liberals to worry about family structure. She's warmed forcefully and bravely that the U.S. is becoming a society of marital haves and have-nots, with two-parent families for those at the top and single parenthood for most others. This is a trend, she warns, that is widening income gaps and thwarting upward mobility. If that seems less daring to say now than it once did, that's in part because Bell's message has taken hold. 
This is a frightening moment in public life. The virtues that the Moynihan Prize celebrates, civility, honesty, quote, informed judgment, are under such relentless attack that the fact checkers at the Washington Post are running out of Pinocchios. <laughs> what a fitting time then to applaud two people of such rare personal and intellectual integrity. Please join me in welcoming the winners of this year's Moynihan Prize, Ron Haskins and Bell Sawhill. Well, first of all, Jason, uh, thank you. Uh, really, that was uh, so uh, warm and generous, and I'm um, in awe of your ability to put that whole story together. Uh, there are not many journalists that have contributed as much as you have to educating the public on issues like poverty and inequality and the family and welfare reform. And I would join um, Ken Pruitt in saying that your book, The American Dream, about three women in Milwaukee was a tour de force uh, that has influenced all of our thinking. So to the uh, Academy, obviously, this is just a huge honor. And uh, Ron and I are enormously um, grateful for it. And I want to offer um, my congratulations or our congratulations to all of the distinguished uh, fellows who are being inducted into the Academy tonight. I can't um, resist saying a little bit more about uh, Jim Heckman, because when Ron and I were writing our last book, which was called Creating an Opportunity Society, we hoped that Jim would take a look at it and give us a book blurb. And we sent the manuscript to Jim, and uh, we never, we didn't hear from him. And to the extent we heard from him, most of what we heard was, "You got this wrong, and you got that wrong." And he even was looking at footnotes. And we were getting very discouraged. And Ron finally said, "Well, we got to just give up on Jim Heckman. He's not, he does not like our book." And so Ron writes what I thought was a pretty polite note or email back to Jim saying, Jim, it's OK if you don't want to comment on our book. And Jim writes back and says, no, no, you don't understand. I really want to comment on it. <laughs> and uh, he gave us what turned out to be a fantastic um, complimentary set of comments about it, as well as having given us feedback on how to correct all of our footnotes. <laughs> um, now. In these days of extreme partisanship, a lot of people probably have a huge problem understanding how Ron and I could have overcome our alleged uh, differences here. And I have to give most of the credit to Ron. I really, I really do. I think Jason was hinting at this, that uh, Ron has had to come. Well, you know, let's face it. The country has moved right. 
And uh, Ron hasn't quite moved as far right as the rest of the country. <laughs> so he may still be a Republican, but he's not what I would call a contemporary Republican. <laughs> And I have to say a few words about Ron because we have worked together for 15 years now. And I think what we all like about Ron, me in particular, is he is really a straight shooter. And I think Jason was trying to capture that as well. He tells you exactly what he thinks. If he doesn't agree with you, you know it. And if he says he's going to compromise or he's going to do something, uh, he sticks to his word. There's no game playing where Ron Haskins is concerned and therefore he is enormously trustworthy. And trust is a attribute that seems to be disappearing from our society and especially from our political system. And I think one of the reasons that we've gotten along so well is because I absolutely trust uh, Ron. Uh, second, you know, he is in enormous demand um, I was riding over here with uh, Ron and his wife, Susan, uh, this evening, and I think Susan and I share a concern about how much Ron does. I mean, Ron gets invited to speak, to write, to advise, um, over and over again, and he never stops. And I think he never sleeps, and I do worry about that, and Susan, I think you worry about that, too. Um, the other thing about Ron is that he really is the embodiment of Senator Moynihan's famous statement that we are all entitled to our own opinions, but we are not entitled to our own facts. Ron is really dedicated to getting the facts right, and I hope I share that, and that makes any disagreement a lot easier to resolve. And then finally, and I just, I can't emphasize this enough, and those of you who know him know this, Ron has a fabulous sense of humor. And I get these little emails from him about some main mundane thing, and at the end of the email many times is there a little tagline that's usually some barb uh, about me or one of our colleagues, but with great humor and affection built into the barb. Now, I have to say a word about uh, Senator Moynihan. I did know the senator, uh, not really well, but we served on an advisory board together of this uh, wonderful little journal, The Public Interest, uh, now defunct, and uh, we um, uh, interacted on some of the issues that we both cared about. And he would pick up the phone and he would uh, ask for your advice, and uh, I just had huge respect for his intellect. Um, and he, I think, was just a towering uh, presence. Uh, and I think as a part of getting ready for tonight, I went back and reread a lot of the things he wrote. And I think his writing has really stood the test of time, which is quite remarkable if you think about it. Um, one of the things that you may not know about his writing is how often he said that there were really limits to what we knew and therefore limits what we about limits about what we could do to improve society and that humility is maybe a characteristic that um, not all of you are aware of uh, I do have to tell one story since Ken your story was wonderful Ken but uh, I'm once at a dinner with a senator, and we both had a number of glasses of wine, and we're talking about something, and I'm not quite understanding what he's trying to tell me, and I ask him to uh, repeat or elaborate, and he looks at me very sternly, and he says, either you're deaf or I'm drunk. <laughs> and I said, Senator, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, finally, I want to close, um, or before I turn this over to Ron, to say a few words about the Academy. And I think institutions like the Academy have a particularly important uh, role to play right now. Um, you know, the Academy is devoted to trying to close the gap between research and policy. And I think that's really important for two reasons. First of all, I think if you just look at the academy, 
it's gotten way too narrow. There are too many people who are intent on publishing a paper in a peer-reviewed journal that only 20 other people will read. And um, I think that the academy tries to recognize people who've used science and research to inform policy to try to make this a better world. And that's a very, very worthy goal. Um, the second is that I think it's important in the current environment that our politics become reconnected to what research has to tell us. And of course, I think that's a problem right now. I was earlier inducted as the Francis Perkins Fellow of the American Academy. And so I've looked up Frances Perkins and some of the things that she said, and I found a wonderful quote today. I'm going to give you a piece of it because I think it's quite relevant. She said, though one believes in the efficacy of the democratic process, one has to also recognize that the demand of the many for a particular project or outcome at a particular time may mean disaster. Now, I think that was Paul Ryan's dilemma today in meeting <laughs> with Mr. Trump. And um, I thought a little bit about what Senator Moynihan would say about where we are right now. And I think what he would have said is the voters are entitled to their own votes, but the candidates are not entitled to their own facts. Thank you for this wonderful honor. I'm very grateful. Um, I normally do not like to brag, but I want to tell you that you're fortunate that I'm the last speaker. And the reason is that when I was on the Hill, I was famous for being able to take member speeches of 15 minutes and cut them down to 30. So uh, <laughs> I, I hope you're comfortable. Uh, it's a great honor, unexpected. Uh, I also knew Moynihan a little bit. I watched him carefully. I think I started being serious about Moynihan uh, probably in 1970 when I was a, a part-time instructor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and I came across this thing called the Moynihan Report, and I could not put it down. I thought about it and thought about it. I didn't know anything about social science, uh, and I never fully recovered from reading that report and had a great opportunity today to talk about it in a serious way the first time I ever did that except in just a glancing way. Um, so I'm extremely grateful to the Academy and the people who support our nomination. It's just wonderful. Um, I also wanted to tell you uh, one little thing from my past. I was in the Boy Scouts, and I really liked the Boy Scouts. And one of the main reasons I liked the Boy Scouts was because we had campfires. And a bunch of guys, 10 years, 11 years, 12 years old, sitting around a campfire singing songs. And one of the songs that we sang, uh, most of them I probably can't discuss, but one of them that I could mention uh, said, if you get to heaven before I do, just bore a hole and pull me through. <laughs> Bell Saw Hill has been pulling me through holes <laughs> for 15 years, <laughs> beginning when I went to Brookings. Now keep in mind, I'm a Republican. I'm a psychologist, developmental psychologist, at the August Brookings Slightly, oh, so slightly left of center. And, and you're not even supposed to say that. Uh, and on the floor with all these famous economists that I've been reading about since I was a freshman at the University of Michigan. Uh, and here's this little psychologist, I, but I knew just how to handle it. I never talked. It was the way to do it. Uh, so it was, and I found out later, I did not know this at the time, but Bell, who in case you don't know, is somewhat formidable in any disagreement, you might as well start out by giving in right away because you're going to lose. Uh, <laughs> and at that time, Brookings had a quite influential and powerful vice president who I, I can imagine that he thought that he was going to tell Bell Sawhill how this was going to come out, that Haskins is not going to come to Brookings. Well, I was there about a month later, I think, uh, and totally because of Bell Sawhill. So it started out, and it has been this way for 15 years, and I'm sure it will end this way, uh, that Bell uh, is in charge. Uh, and it's a good thing to recognize that because it, it saves a lot of trouble. Uh, 
Now I want to tell you one story about Bell that I think perfectly captures her. I think it was in 2008, Bell and I had had several conversations. Oh, one thing I meant to say, I want to say this real quickly. I, I'm also indebted to Heckman uh, for doing that nice blurb. It is a very nice blurb from our big, and I've always thought that that blurb is why we sold way over 60 copies, Bell. <laughs> Can you imagine if he hadn't written that blurb? We work all that time and sell a dozen books, come on. And eight of them were to my relatives, so. Um, so Belle and I were having a very serious conversation. Belle has a very nice place in Colorado that she would like to go to, and she'd go maybe three or four times a year and stay 15, 20 minutes and come back, <laughs> start working. And so she told me, astounded me actually, I was completely surprised, she said, you know, we're getting a little long in the tooth, I had to point out to her that her teeth are a lot longer than mine. Uh, and she said, I think that we should cut back a little bit. That was in 2008. By 2010, Bell Saw Hill had raised over $4 million to establish a new set of activities having, which we affectionately called the Social Genome Project, which I think is an extremely important project and it's gonna stand up well, it's, it already has gotten a lot of attention, and I think it captures what uh, I, I'm sure Bell and I have come to feel, and maybe some other people in this audience, there is no such thing as an inoculation in social policy or social programs. You have to, we're gonna to have to help kids over and over and over again, it's gonna to have to start in a preschool period or even before that, and then in elementary school and high school and so forth, and that is the essence of Bell's model to how you get to be middle class by middle age when you start out in the bottom quintile and you're poor is we help you in several different ways throughout the lifespan. And I think that's what we're gonna have to do. So that's Bell's idea of semi-retirement. Uh, you're gonna lean back here and take it easy and raise $4 million and start a whole new discipline. That's, that's the way she does things. Uh, I wanna say one last thing and that is, um, I wanna say something about my wife uh, who joined my family at a particularly inopportune time. Uh, and it's the only sense in which I'm modern. I live in a blended family. Everything else, I'm not modern. And if you, some of you may live in blended families, and they are not easy, especially when my kids are somewhat difficult, some of them. And Susan is the hero of all our kids. So you're my hero too, but to be the hero of those kids and then our own child is an amazing thing. And I wanna point out one thing before I close here, uh, that the best practice I ever had for working with Bell Sawhill was working with you. <laughs> and, and I finally figured out how I could always get the last word. And the last word is yes, ma'am.